the Man Up Podcast with your hosts, Chris Farley. And today with my set my co-host, John Candy. John Candy and David Spade. Good to be back. I don't even know what I was talking You're about. You're the there. only one still alive. Mm-hmm. Congratulations, How's it feel? man. Won't be long now. <laughs> <laughs> No, but seriously, Jake from Superman Reeves here with Tyler Copeland and Mr. Porch Talk himself, Alan Aldridge. Uh, I didn't use your nickname. I feel like such a loser. You both guys have such cool nicknames, and then I'm just Tyler. What do you want your nickname to be, man? I, you just my real name. That's it. That's what I did. I know. So what are you loser. mad about? Loser. I'm not. Oh, you just like being a loser? Yeah. You ever just punch yourself in the arm? Yeah, I would, but I'm not. Oh, uh, because you got hurt shadow boxing? Yeah. I did. How you get hurt? I heard my wrist shadow boxing last night, training for bare knuckle brawl. Is that how hyped you was? Yeah. yeah. Last night wasn't even the fight. Spice the night before last. Last. Oh, I know. He just stayed hyped. Yeah. He, he, who's uh? Who was your fighter? The coworker. Who? That one. Joe Sayer. Joe Sayer. Yeah, y'all should get together and shadow box. Man. I feel like you and Joe Sayer should fight. Me and Joe <laughs> Sayer. Well, if I hadn't hurt my wrist shadow boxing, we would. Do it in like a year. But now I'm injured. Six probably, months. I probably still injured over. in the next two years. Him barrel training. Lives, the barrel training was lives in my oh mind. Oh man, that barrel training was something. He's he's a really good athlete. He's something. I could tell. Yeah, he's something for sure. He's definitely something. Without a doubt, he's something. He's special. He, he's something. He is something. I can't. Oh, that's, that's, uh, I'm trying to turn the. Uh, We're gonna watch Silver Linings Playbook. I do. Um, that's why I turned it on. I like you know this is a really good movie. It's about a boy and a girl and a playbook. That I kept was waiting stolen. for this shit to get funny, and it just never did. It was a playbook stolen from the University of Michigan. I see. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. And then what it was, it was given to everybody around the Big Ten, and then Michigan's coach got suspended. For Man, it. I've been seeing like I really don't have an opinion on this. All right, but yes, I do. Is uh, lately I've been seeing a trend of like teachers losing their jobs because they have OnlyFans. Now, where, where I draw the line is like, let's say you're married with child, or you're just with child. Like, do you not think that that's going to cause issues? For, Are you saying you're pregnant? Uh, yeah, I'm, that's what I'm saying. You have an issue. Do, with Do you not that think like pregnant? you feel some kind of way like? Fellas at school get up one day and like they're all snickering and laughing at an image on the phone and they show you and it's your mom naked. Yeah, it's got to make you feel some kind of way. Hopefully Do you not know horny. how many fucking kids have that happened to though? I mean, get yeah. over it. All of them. Get the fuck over it. It's like, hey, do you I'm know? Just kidding. I've never seen a naked picture of my mom. Huh, son? No. Do you know why you're riding around in that pickup truck at the age of sixteen? Yeah, because my titties sold that shit. Get over it. I mean, porn stars, kids, come on. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I don't I'm gonna care. give you an opposing view here. I, I don't. I would rather not have the truck and just my mom not put her stuff online. I'm sure. I agree. You know, but I'm just saying. I mean, the kids who do have this, that. This is shit. my problem with like public school <clears throat> in general, is because it's like, all right, we got we've got public school, and public school really can't. It's hard to enforce morality because what what version of morality is public school going to enforce? If we're really going to be fair, and we're going to say, okay, we're going to keep a separation of church and state, right? But state's going to be in charge of educating the the youth. What version of morality is going to be enforced by the state? state. Is it going to be the Christian version of morality? Yeah. Is it going to be Islam's version of morality? The state's version of morality? State's version. So what is that, and what's that based on? Pornhub. Well, I would say I'm you right now. I would say the culture. Uh, so that that's and it's gonna, li- it's gonna live, go with the wind then. We live with, in a extremely sexualized culture. So, so it's gonna go with the wind. Why do you not have time for me then? <laughs> I, just, I don't have time for you right now, Tyler. For being honest, I just you, I just, you know, like I just you're gonna derail me if it's I. Not if a I derailment if I'm being truthful. You think that Pornhub is setting the standard for morality in the culture? You no, I'm just you, saying it's part you of. You can't the even get on Pornhub on this state. That's true. Not in Mississippi. But you can and everywhere else. But much. now Virginia, you can't either. You can't go to the fucking uh, Utah, the where state. the Mormons you are. Can't do shit. You well, can. I guess that's true. Now. You got the reservation. Do a lot of shit here. We're on the coast. Can't gamble yeah. on college football in this state. Really? Really? That's why I do all my shit in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> Wump them. <laughs> Pounds. Uh, you know, I, and th- but that's the problem. What version of morality is gonna gonna be? And if if you say morality is subjective. 
then morality is going to be constantly changing at a rate in which you can't track it, which is what we're living with now. We live in a world where morality changes so quickly that nobody could ever uphold or abide by this new version of morality where you can't say well. all these trigger words. Because that's what it is. The leftist, the, the, the leftist woke movement is morality with no deity. That's what it is. It's, it's state-enforced morality with no deity and no, and no holy book. The holy book is just whatever they say it is at that particular day. So there is no morality. There is, well, there is morality, but it's, there isn't, there's no standard of it. It's going to constantly change. And it has been for a while. So I'm not saying that, that, that every, any other version is perfect, but that's the problem. And that's the problem with public schools yeah. is, well, now we're going to ask the government to uphold morality, but what version are we going to uphold? You know what I mean? Yeah, and that's no, the problem. No. So if there was a private yeah. Christian school that the teacher had an OnlyFans and she got fired, I'd have no problem with it because that doesn't align with the morality being taught in the school that, that has a, a, a direct link to this holy book and this deity that we have a standard in which we abide by. But when you hand things over to the public school, you're kind of asking for this. You're kind of asking for, you know, what happens when somebody wants to be a professional fighter and a school teacher like Rich Franklin? If you have a if you have a poor of any any type of violence you view as sinful, well, should he get fired? I don't think so because I don't have a problem with it, but somebody will. It is it is kind of wild. Like those who work in like the public sector, like that, such as education, or even like if you're in like the service industry. Let's say that you're in law enforcement or a firefighter, or maybe you're a lineman from the municipality. Is like the way that you have to carry yourself within that community is it's held to a higher standard. Because I believe what standard? the the populace uh, to whatever the populace thinks. So what do they like, think? That's the question. Well, I mean, like in the city that I work for, like. And I wouldn't do it anyway because it would be stupid. But, like, if you go out, like, after work, like, you leave work at 5 and you're going to the bar, you better not have your company shirt on. You better be in street clothes. Yeah. That, like, they'll fire you on the spot for that. Really? It was like, that's... Because they don't want you representing them out. Right. Right. And, and, and you also have a, a liability issue. Like, you're still in your work clothes. You knock somebody out of the bar. They get hurt. Yeah. And now, all of a sudden, they're suing the company. Yeah. Which yeah. happens. That Which kind of stuff happens. Public sector stuff, right? Yeah. Like people, and once again, like, you know, wearing your hat backward if you got your company hat on or whatever else. Yeah, you have to protect yourself in that way in this day and age. And, like, another thing about the culture, one thing I was thinking about, like, think about the 70s. Whether it's music, whether it's the way that people dress. Like, when, you, when I say think of the 70s, an image should pop up in your mind of what it sounds like and what it looked like. The 80s, you had the dudes had like the, the hair metal hair, like it was real feathered. Uh, the music was very synthy. The 90s, even it was grunge. It was Nirvana, Stone Temple Pilot. We wore uh, plaid shirts and we had blue blue jeans with the hose in the knees. Mm. And that was like, uh, and then in the 2000s, American culture as a whole, and it's been this way for the past going on 23 years to where it's homogenous. And I don't know if it's the internet that caused that because now. You still have people that dress like they're living in the 90s, they're living in the 80s, they're living in the 70s. Mm -hmm. But if you think about the 2000s or the 2010s or even uh, the decade that we're in now, you cannot put your pin on – you can't pin the tail on the donkey on what that decade is. Does that make sense? <laughs> Tyler can't do these Thinking about those pipe, those fucking pipe, pipe jeans. Lee Pipes. Yeah. Whatever the big, the big huge barrel. Yeah, Lee Pipes. Yeah, that's actually what I was thinking about. Really? I was trying to think about what they're. So what, what you're saying is there is no culture anymore. I and I think the internet calls that. It's like used I don't culture. Think it's a bad thing. You're saying it's used, like everything. Because you've got you have you. Have well, I mean, like just, we go to Hot Topic, and I mean, like your your daughter is about that age. Like you go to a Hot Topic, she'll probably pick out a Nirvana shirt. Yeah, she she wears grunge, '90s grunge stuff. Yeah, that's, that's that was over 30 years ago. It's yeah. like, why is there not anything culturally relevant to what the culture is doing now that people well, are wearing? Well, now it's blue hair and piercings and... and, and the septum rings. Yeah. Beards I mean, if you're a woman. I mean, and long <laughs> hair and makeup if you're a dude. Yeah. That's, yeah. That is that is kind of, That's kind of what the culture is. That like, is the culture. It, it is a recycled 80s and 90s. We do have a very recycled... But you also, in the, in the 90s, you saw a recycling of the 70s. You know? So... It's history repeating itself yeah. like always. I, I think I don't know. I, I don't. I, I think the, another thing that the internet's done, and that I kind of think is a good thing. You see the music. 
uh, there's enough room for a lot of different things now. So there's not one thing that everybody's doing. Sure, like musicians are no longer like catered to like you know Sony or Warner Brothers, the right. big labels. And right. it's like, well, the only way to break out and be heard would to be on those labels. Or how else could you get on the radio? Or how else could you play it? What well, Red Rocks or whatever venue? But the internet changed that. Yeah, it made it like. Love it or hate it, Napster or even before that, LimeWire, and now we have Spotify and all these different streaming apps. That literally gives someone uh, with as much street credit as me, which is absolutely zero. But I am on the same level playing field as such as a Led Zeppelin right. at this point because you can Google my name just as easy as you can theirs. Right. Yeah. So as long as you're willing to go out there and do the work and market and get your name out there, you can. And mm-hmm. if you're not as good, you don't make it. And if people vibe with you, and the, and the thing, and it really gives you that thousand true fan ability, because you know they say I forget who it was said that you know you don't need to be selling millions of albums. You need a thousand true fans, a thousand fans that really love you and really follow you. That's I, that's how you become successful. I'm you just, have a thousand true fans. I'm just working on a hundred right now. Then right. I'll start working on a thousand. But like you're absolutely right. Think about it, man. Like when I started making shirts for the podcast. Some of the sayings or like some of the things that was done over. And, you know, I thought we were doing well if we sold 2025 20, shirts. It was like, wow, 2025 20, people got yeah. the joke or whatever else. And then I talked to bands or other people who are, you know, their, their content is themselves and they're making a shirt and merchandise around that. And they was like, it's been a year and we sold eight. And I was like, and I was beating myself up over 25 eight shirts. Yeah. Oh, wow. And I was like, maybe I have a bigger following than I thought, you know? Yeah. Yeah, if it's been a year and they've only sold eight shirts, that's rough. Yeah, it's really that's rough. bad. That's tough. That's tough because you. Should, I mean, your How mom, your dad, your aunt, every like if everybody in the band sells one of their mom and dad, that should be eight right there. Right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. How many people bought twice? Yeah, exactly. Like, I, I'll buy one myself. And even like, well, you're Brandon, dude. It's like I can't tell you. Like, literally every day on eighty two, like going to and from Starville is. It's not uncommon to see three or four relentless stickers on the back of a pickup truck. Like your your branding and your signature is like it's all over both towns. Yeah, and yeah. it's a, and it's a, like right when I see that logo, like I know what. Oh, that's that's probably one of my people. Yeah, you know? right. Yeah, exactly. And that's it's it's actually funny because it's not uncommon for me to be driving down the road and see somebody in a relentless sticker and me look in the car and not know who they are. Look, I've never seen that person before. Really, yeah, that's that wild. All the time. That was all the time people were riding around. Because here's the thing. All right, so what I what I started doing, stickers are not expensive to make. No. So when you sign up, I give you one for free. I give everybody that signs up gets a free sticker. Um, a lot of times I give them free gear, too. And it's free marketing, too. Right. And, and so it, the sticker cost me $2, right? So I give you a sticker you put on your car. It was marketing. It cost me $2. Mm-hmm. You know, if I And now every time you're like a – you're a moving billboard every time you go down the interstate. Right. Exactly. Um do the same, the same with t-shirts. Why well, I don't have any t-shirts anymore? Because I started just giving them away for free. I just okay, I, I went and bought nice t-shirts, like not the Gildan cheap, crappy one, the Delta Tri Blend one. Like my markup on them is very small. Like I don't make very much money on my t-shirts. Oh well, my t-shirt shop right now, dude, it's like I make like a a dollar eighty. You know, really? like are you drop shipping? What do you? What's the drop ships? Okay, yeah. but like I keep I try to keep the price of the shirt down, like. Because I'm not trying to make money, like, a lot of money. But, like, if you're willing to pay $20, $25 and, like, hey, I'm at a music festival and, like, people are asking about the shirt, that's a win for me. Yeah. And so I try to make my shirts as trippy as possible. Smart. Smart. You know, make, put put sayings that are funny and catchy on there. Mm-hmm. Things that catch, you know, that's why I do the firm believers in punching people in the mouth or the you know just, it's provocative yeah something that's just yeah. like, oh damn what's, what's this guy talking about just yeah. to get a reaction mm-hmm. you know and then i sell the shirt for 20 25 bucks but i mean they cost me like 18 you yeah. know what i mean like or 15 that's yeah, not like, a bad return on something like that though like, you know it is you should, i mean you really should have 100 percent markup if you're really trying to make yeah. money like if it cost, if you're selling for 25 it shouldn't cost you more like 1250 yeah but to me when it comes to advertising. when it comes to branding and marketing like it's yeah. almost worth I don't see it as an expense yeah it's like the gas session uh like selling gas for as cheap as they can because like they're just hoping that you'll come in and shop with them right. like you'll get the candy bar or the pack of smokes whatever right. else is that Walmart put everybody out of business with think, ab- think about Costco like what was the one thing like when all this inflation was going on back in 2021 when Biden nomics started kicking and there was rumor that the dollar fifty Costco hot dog was going to be more than a dollar fifty, and people were like, "WTF, dude? What what's going on?" 
And so the CEO came out and, like, base as fuck. And he was like, no, I don't care if I lose money on those hot dogs. Like, right. that's what brings people in here because I know if they come in here and buy a fifty hot dog, they're about to go shop. Yeah. So f- fuck them. Yeah. You know, them, them hot dogs I'll eat. Yeah. I don't care. And, you know, that's, that's what a lot of big companies do. Good one. He'll eat the hot dog. Uh, I'll eat the hot dog, too. Good job. I've never had a hot dog <sighs> Costco hot dog. It's not bad. Same. Never, never been in a Costco. Same. Well, I mean, they're not really around here. Uh-uh. Got Sam's Club, but no Costco. Yeah, the, the only one I ever was had gone through was down on the coast in Mobile. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I've never been in. Pretty one. good experience. I think I still prefer Sam's Club just because I grew up in it and I know my way around. Do you know your way around Sam's Club that well? Mm-hmm. I mean, I've been in a lot of Sam's Clubs, but it's been a long time. So. And that's something else, man. Like. I mean, we were talking about on the last episode, like, when you go out to eat, how easy is it when you're going out where you bought? Now, if you're not with your family, of course, you want to go to a nice place, try something new. But how easy is it to just be on a four-hour drive and, like, you both getting a little hungry and you see that Taco Bell or that the Golden Arches of Truth that is McDonald's be like, yeah, we're about to get something that we know. That golden Arches of Truth. Yeah, that's, that's – uh that's that consistency of the product is yeah. what makes them big. Mm-hmm. It's not about the, how good the product is; it's about how consistent the product is. Because people like things that they know. People like things they they recognize. And how uh, how frustrated? Right, yeah, seems seem like your wrist is hurting pretty it's, bad. It's huh? pretty not good. How frustrated are you it's when you go in there and you get a bad you get a bad sandwich? It kind of turns you off for a while. Yeah. And that's one thing I think you, you get a little busted up about that. It's like it's always this quality. Right. It's always the same. It's the same all the time. Uh, make it as repeatable as possible. That turnkey business model that you can scale, and it's, it's sort of like a story I was telling. And I, I tell my coaches here this: um, something that I learned in coaching, like MMA and jiu-jitsu, is change your techniques. Don't change your class structure. Anytime you change class structure, you lose people. Um, yeah, you pe- want to keep the structure. We're creatures that have it, right? Right. There's a story. There's a there's a uh, there's a book. Oh, what's it called? I believe it's the E Myth. I, I believe that's the book that this is in. But he talks about he. Uh, you need you need your drink. You make you make you some ice dog. I'll make you no, ice man, bath. I'm just gonna go to the doctor. I tell you what, y'all talk for a second. I'm I have nothing my... to say because I'm really in pain. So I'm just listening. But if, so I, you're but good. if I go get you an ice pack, you won't be in as much pain. Maybe. I don't know. If that's true. Well, that's you know, true. ibuprofen. Well, that no. problem helped with swelling. With I had it. some no, ibuprofen. Will fucking help with swelling. Tylenol well, earlier and it wore off. And now I'm. Where? Hey, that'd be, that, that that'd be fast right action, now. dude. Yeah, take it with this beer; it'll, it'll multiply. BC. Please, dude. I'm sorry. Get your BC and wash it down with some beer. Man. But anyway, they were talking in this book. I believe it was the E Myth. He was saying that uh, there was a guy. He went to a barber. It was a guy that wrote the book. He went to a barber and he got the best haircut of his life. And <laughs> at this haircut, he he, he he had great service. He got the best haircut he ever had. While he was waiting, they gave him a cup of coffee. Um, the guy only used scissors, and then during the haircut, talked about how just using scissors made it a better haircut. Right? Even though it took longer, he got the he got the best haircut ever. But you know, it comes back the second time. The second time, he doesn't give him a cup of coffee. He uses the trimmers a little bit on the side, but it's still mostly scissors. Still got the best haircut of his life. Third time he went back, the guy only used scissors. He gave him a glass of wine while he waited. Um, only use scissors, still got the best haircut of his life, and never went back. And he says, I can't explain to you why I never went back. It was inconsistent. But as a human, what as I understand psychology a little bit more now, people like to feel like they're in control of their environment. Mm-hmm. That's the key. We want to feel that we're in control. We want to fear feel that we have control of the world that we're living in on a day-to-day basis. And when you're going and you're buying a product and then that product is not what you expect, even if it's great, if it's not what you expect, it kind of triggers you into being like, this is not what I expected. I'm not in control of the change around me. And it makes you less likely to keep shopping there. I learned that in, in cl- with classes. I would, tr- anytime I go in and introduce new, something new, mm-hmm. even if it's better than what we had before my class numbers drop for a short period of time yeah. and I got to replenish them with new people. Some people are going to come back no matter what. They love you. They love the brand. They love what you're doing. So, like, what have you found in those, like, scenarios? Is that something that you would maybe offer on, like, an off day? Be like, hey, we want to try something new. We're going to try this new class. Typically, maybe. no. Typically, if I if I want to try something new, uh, 
if I know something's going to be long term for the better, I just go ahead and calculate in a certain amount of loss. Okay. Uh, it, it, I go ahead and calculate in. Okay, we're going to have a ten to fifteen percent drop. What about like on this. when you stepped away from like being here full time and like you know turning it over to Mo and you have I know you got Phil and you got other guys helping out coaching, but like does the experience that the people had like do they miss you being the um, the man in here or it's like are, well, I'm still are, here are, a lot. I'm still I'm still here usually three nights a week at least, uh, but it, you're gonna have some drop off. Yeah, for sure. Once people know that like there's a certain class that I'm not gonna be at regularly, you'll see a drop off in that class. So with MMA, we I think I've gradually left MMA to mow more, and over time it's taken less and less of a hit. So. It's the reason why, as I've come back from coaching my my kids' football team, I've not inter- put myself back in there full time still. And the reason I haven't is I know if I do, um, for one thing, I've been I haven't been away so long that that would may have a big effect. But like if I'm gone for a long time and then I come back, me coming back can cause a drop off because people are used to somebody else. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing is I don't want to train people into thinking I have to be here all the time. And so I'm purposefully like, okay, I'm willing to take a little bit of a hit to train people like, okay, I don't have to be here five nights a week. You know, I could be here three nights a week and we still have good product. And the thing is, man, like like with what we do, you don't need me. A lot of these purple belts, even some of these blue belts, can yeah. teach other white belts just as good as I can. Yeah, you know they they may not have every detail that I'm teaching, but that, a lot of these white belts don't need every detail that I'm teaching. You know they just need broad strokes to start with, and then and then clean it up a little bit at a time. Uh, some of them do, but you know we, what I found is, and, and I'm I'm still experimenting with this. And you're definitely going to have some haters that are going to be mad that you're not there all the time. Thought you when I signed up, and I, I signed up to train with you. But the how they day, come at it like that from time not, to time? Not to me to my face, but definitely behind my back. I can kind of see that, man. I mean, maybe if we lived down on Biloxi, I mean, and, and you had the opportunity to be in Belcher's gym, like you, his name probably that was a big thing. That's where I heard it the first time. You know, was because you know Belcher. You know, I want to be a gym empire at one time. I want to be in the same room as right. him. You know, built this huge empire, but Belcher didn't teach that much. Mike Sanford was the one teaching. You had James Sharp teaching. You had, and then he had four locations. Well, he obviously can't be at four locations teaching. Yeah, you know. So you got four kind of locations. Fooling yourself at this point. All right, if you think he's going to be there all the time, <laughs> but I remember when he he came up, he was the most expensive in town, just like me. I'm the most expensive in town. He was the most expensive in town. And then I remember a lot of people saying like, "Oh man, it's so expensive," and uh, he's not even there. You're training with his coaches, and it's like, well, of course you are, bro. Like, unless what you're, did you think? Right, he's and he was currently <laughs> fighting in the UFC, dude. That's like going to Nashville and going to like Blake Shelton's bar, right? And, and expecting Aldean's and expecting to sit next to Jason Aldean, yeah, 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 or Blake Shelton, like yeah, you're yeah. yeah. Like, or either, you, either way, yeah. It's like, what, what are you thinking? You think he's gonna be the guy playing there every night, right? No, yeah. <laughs> it. But that being said, you also do have a certain level of, um, coaching that I think needs to be brought every night. Like, there's a certain level of technique. There's a certain level of understanding of jiu-jitsu that needs to be there on a regular basis. And what I found, too, is um, letting your students coach actually helps with the retention because you're going to get to a certain point. You're going to have a lot of people, especially your people that aren't fighters and competitors, they need a next step. They need a next step. And if you're not a fighter and a competitor, what's your next step? Coach. You want to coach. You want to teach. It's the only it's the only logical next step. If you're not a, an athlete, you want to coach. So you have people that it's if just, I don't if I don't let them do that it, and let them it. have that that experience of like damn Tyler's hurting, he's he's over to the side, he ain't coming back home. Uh, if I don't let them have that experience, I'm robbing them because I want it all for myself. I want to be the guy. Yeah, I want to be the guy that gets pat on. Oh, you're such a good coach, coach. Oh, thank you so much. If I don't let anybody else have that. I'm robbing them of that experience. I'm not. I'm not throwing any shade at like uh, any coach or or maybe I am at some teachers, but like I've always heard it like those who can't do coach and those who can't do anything else will teach. Yeah. And but like and I'm not throwing shade because I think it's like what you said. There is nothing wrong coming here and like honing BJJ and like you know your blue purple belt brown belt black belt. It's like well I'm not trying to be in the UFC, but right. I will. I will. I will pass this knowledge so, on. So let me tell you why that's true and why that's okay. 
Those that can't do coach. 100% true. 100% oh, I'm not true. saying it to be. No, it's true. And I'm going to tell you why it's true and why it's okay that it's true. All right. I think the best example of this is Rick Rufus and Duke Rufus. Right? You know who Rick Rufus is? No, tell me. Rick Rufus was very likely the greatest kickboxer they that ever lived. They are brothers. Their dad's fucking hilarious. And so. Uh, Dick and Rick. <laughs> Rick, and, uh, Rick and Duke. Oh. Duke and oh. Rick. Yeah. So Rick Rufus was very likely the best full contact kickboxer like back in the 80s that ever lived. He was amazing. He killed everybody. Matter of fact, he fought Oliver Miller uh, here in town. They fought on ESPN at one time. Uh, two or three round decision. Uh, he also fought. There was a famous fight with him and a Muay Thai fighter from Thailand, in which he lost from, due to TKO by leg kicks. And uh, but it was like the best kickboxer versus a Thai guy, and the Thai guy won uh, in a mixed rules bout. So then you had Duke. Duke was not Rick. Duke was never close to Rick. Duke did Muay Thai. He did. He started doing Muay Thai after Rick lost. He's like, okay, there's d- definitely something to be learned here. Duke was not the athlete Rick was. Duke was never even close but he, to the athlete. But technical. Was. But he was super technical. And the reason he was so technical was because he had to be. He Everything had to be perfect for him to even compete. So when you have somebody who's a super athlete that can do, they don't really understand the technique in the same way that the really, really technical, less athletic fighter is. Because the really, really athletic fighter, he doesn't have to be perfect. He can do it mostly right and get the knockout. The super technical fighter, he's not getting the knockout no matter what. Everything's got to be perfect, or he's going to get knocked out. So a lot of times, those fighters will go through their whole career. At the end of the f- career, this guy might be, let's say he's 50 and 2, 50 and 0, whatever. This guy's 20 and 15. Mm-hmm. This guy's 10 times the coach of the undefeated guy. And then you see people like Duke Rufus who go on to become one of the best coaches in the world. He started Rufus Sport. He was Allen's coach. He was Anthony Pettis' coach. He was uh, CM Punk's coach, ironically. He was a lot of big names in the sport. Yeah. He was their coach. Not Rick. Not Rick. Rick didn't have that gift. Duke had that gift. Because Duke didn't have the, the athleticism to go in there and be the best fighter. Yeah. But because he had to be absolutely perfect with everything he did in order to even compete – he knew how to take these other people who were more athletic than him and teach them to be perfect. And now you've got the super athletes who are fighting and, and have the coach who's teaching them to be perfect, mm-hmm. and that creates greatness. Those who don't do coach is a real thing that's that way for a reason. It's, it helps. It helps to have people that aren't – look at Nick Saban. Nick Saban was not the best defensive back ever. He wasn't the best athlete. No. He, he absolutely wasn't. For sure, there's no question. Nick Saban didn't make it in the NFL, you know, as a coach either. But still, he didn't make it in the NFL. He wasn't great in college. Why was he such a great coach? He understood understood the the game. game. He understood the Mm -hmm. game. Is he necessarily the best player? No, because in sports, there's just a level of athleticism that if you don't have, you're not going to compete. You just got to have it. Well, with that and, like, back to the culture thing just for a second, is, like, someone – let's take Deion Sanders – out of Colorado right now. He left Jackson State, which was not successful when he came, but very successful. It's not successful now that he's gone. Right. Now he's at Colorado. Just because of the, the hype of his name will draw young athletes right. who admired him as an athlete. Right. He may not be as technical as a Nick Saban or a Belichick or a Kirby Smart, but just because of the draw of his name, he will get dynamic players, yeah. and he'll surround himself with people, you know, maybe the more technical. That really – but you know what the thing is? That's really, I think, what Nick Saban and Kirby Smart do exceptionally well. I think what Nick Saban taught Kirby Smart is – and I'm, I'm not saying that this is easy because, I mean, some, some programs you just can't do it. But if you can get into a Georgia or get into an Alabama, the key to a great program is having the best players – that can work as a unit. Mm-hmm. Go get the best players. If you don't have the best players in football, you're not going to have a good program. It doesn't matter. Well, I mean, we've, we've even seen this. Like, take Auburn, for example. They had Bo Nix, and, like, he wasn't working at the Auburn program. I would say, like, the coaching probably wasn't right for him. Now he's at Oregon. He's doing great. Yeah. He's in the right program. He's in the right kind of offense that suits his quarterback style. Yeah. And, I mean, a big difference. Heisman contender. Yeah. I don't know if he'll get the invite to go. After everything's said and done, but he was talked about. Yeah, over and that's, time, that's impressive. Yeah, just getting talked about as a Heisman contender is impressive. Yeah. you know, 
So I, I, I don't know, I th- but I do think that but, uh, I don't get offended because I'm a coach. Yeah. Right? And like people talk about those that can't do coach, and I'm a coach. I'm a way better coach than I was. Well, player. I think – I see, like, you have more of, like – you're more of in a transition in period, and I may be wrong with this, but dude, I mean, your body's getting older. Yeah, I've been so in a transition like, period for like six years. Yeah, but like you're yeah. transitioning like more into like the athleticism. You're still very athletic, but the not te- for the next level. The, the, the yeah, and but the technical aspect of you is like beginning to trump the athleticism. Yeah. Uh, I, that's been in transition for a while. Uh, I definitely. And Mo, are you uh, are you more technical? Would you consider that? I mean, you got to answer it. I mean, I'm not going to answer it for you. You want me to answer it for you? I mean, I would like to think I had to be more technical, but, like, when I get a lot of com- – last few times I've rolled, you know, I tend to use strength more than I way need to, and I, I don't feel like I'm using strength. Like, I really don't, but I know that's just experience. Well, you're exhausted in the, every roll, so you're clearly using strength. But, uh, but like, for some reason, though, I, I, as soon as the bell rings again, it's this, I use the same amount of strength every time. Yeah, no, you don't. No, you get weaker as the rolls go on. Yeah, but yeah, you get, and I do too. But you, would, you but definitely. I would say I would have to be more technical because I'm short. I gotta get my footwork right, head, and I can't just keep walking into punches. He's trying to yeah. drill that into my head. Mo is Mo is in a transition himself. So Mo Mo's Mo's in his own transition. Yeah, I thought it would be interesting, like hearing his perspective. I mean, you know, yeah. he's he's in his own transition. Whereas, like, <laughs> and that's the thing about bringing up coaches. Is uh, and even like Phil. I mean, he was an Air Force guy, and now he yeah, he, pilot. yeah, and now he coaches here. I mean, mm-hmm. it's a kids program, but still, yeah, I mean, he helps with the adult program too. Uh, the well, adult jujitsu, like a bit more of like on classes I can't teach jujitsu. He teaches him, him, Jared Garrett, and and Drew Coggins. They 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 all teach jujitsu. Say Goggins? <laughs> no, Coggins. Yeah. Dude, you got Goggins up for this bitch? <laughs> uh, not David, <laughs> not Goggins, but anyway, uh. Yeah, they 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 all they're all my purple belts, and they all teach, and um, they're all they're all pretty technical, honestly. They're all pretty technical. They 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 all have their strengths and their weaknesses, um, but they're all they're all pretty technical. I mean, to get a purple belt under me now, you you're gonna have to be, you're gonna have even if you are a good athlete. Like, uh, there's a certain level of technique you just gotta have for me to give you a purple belt. You'll stay blue forever, even if you're tapping purples. If I don't feel like you have the technique, you know, at least to somewhat back up a purple belt, I'm not gonna give it to you. Um, there's just definitely there's definitely something to coaching versus being an athlete. They're just they're different roles. You, you a lot of people do both, like I did, and, and like a lot of fighters you see like the last several years of their fight career, they're coaching as well. So they're coaching and fighting, and they're building both skill sets. Um, but you see people that are really good fighters that try to make that transition and just can't. Yeah, they just can't do it. They they don't know how. They don't know like. And I don't mean this ugly. I'm not going to call any names here. But, like, if you're a fighter, like a – I'm not – like a Chris Lieben. And I don't mean this any disrespect to Chris Lieben. Chris Lieben's a great fighter, and he's a coach now. And I think he probably is doing well as a coach. Think about Chris Lieben. Chris Lieben built his career on um, standing in the pocket and trading and having an iron chin and the ability to knock people out. Yeah, that, but, but, that button gets bigger and bigger. I can't – you can't teach that. Right. You can't teach someone and not be able to get knocked out. Can't teach somebody to have a one punch, punch knockout. Those aren't those aren't teachable qualities. Mm-hmm. You have to, as a coach, you have to remove a little bit on the te- the te- technical side. Remove all as much of the athleticism as you possibly can from the equation. What's going to work for the least athletic person? What's going to work consistently for someone who's not a freak athlete? Then teach that technique to the freak athlete, and they'll be unstoppable. Okay, like with the with the with the freak athlete uh, who is just like let's just say maybe even Deontay Wilder if we go boxing for a minute, it's like he's the bronze bomber. He's got this ridiculous haymaker. It's like as a coach, like don't you want to lean into their pros? For sure, absolutely, absolutely. No, no. So what I, what I mean by this is that being okay, there are there but there are athletes. You could go in there that hit hard enough, that are athletic enough. You could teach them a little bit of jiu-jitsu, a little bit of wrestling. Go out there and throw that bomb, and they're going to knock people out, and they're going to win fights. They're going to win fights. They're not going <coughs> to win world titles, though. Yeah. And if you took that guy and taught him really good boxing, he could win a world title. Um, so, so, so yes and no. Lean into the strengths, for sure. And I think that's something a lot of coaches don't do well. Um, like, if I've got a fighter 
that has a really, really unbelievable isometric strength. And I've had these great isometric athletes like myself. I'm a great isometric ath athlete. I'm not so plyometric. So I'm great at squeezing, not good at exploding. Like I'm not, I'm not crazy fast. I can't jump really high. I don't run really fast. But if I grab you, I'm really strong. Uh, like a Grady Hurley's that way too. Grady doesn't look like he moves really well, but if Grady grabs you, man, he's strong as shit. Like he, like you just, you're not getting loose. He's got that isometric well, hold, squeeze and hold, that's, and and it doesn't get tired. When you get up to someone of your size, do you think like plyometrics kind of goes out of the window? No, because I I have seen some. That's, some Deontay Wilder is exactly the the example of unbelievable explosive energy you cannot be a great boxer unless you have explosive energy yeah like as, uh, in striking you have to be explosive you can't be a great striker without explosivity grappling is going to complement the isometric hold type strength guys a little bit more so if i have somebody that way i'm definitely going to teach them to be more of a wrestler i'm definitely going we're going to work on the wall more we're gonna. I'm gonna teach you how to get takedowns. I'm gonna teach you how to squeeze and hold people down. Use your top pressure. Get on top and beat the people up and just cook them. If you're super fast, but you don't have that plot, that you, and you're you've got explosive power and you can knock people unconscious, we're gonna base more of what we're doing on cutting angles and not sitting in front of people. Not not giving the wrestlers a chance to get a hold of you, where we can give ourselves the most. Uh, a highest percentage. What's it? Uh, chance of the knockout. You know. What's it like when people get your calling card? Like they've you got you got quite a bit of game film, and people know how to go about you. Be like, okay, he's really going to use his height and his wingspan against you. Well, so great. it's great. it's one thing to know what to do. It's another thing to do it. Yeah. You know, that's it, like you, you. I could. So I'll, you don't you don't really like. Okay, let's just say word from the other gym that you're going to box their guy or it. UFC style MMA fight this guy of, and word on the street is they've got every one of your weaknesses down to a T. Yeah, they will. Yeah, and they're okay. they're going to try to exploit you on that. Right, and we're going to do the same thing to them. Okay, but like, how much does that change like your game plan? Like, um, surely you're you're sticking to what you know. Most of the time, most people are going to go in there and do what they do well. You know what I mean? That's just the way that it is. I can't I can't train you to be a whole different fighter in a six yeah. eight week camp. Yeah. Like if like if people know that you're gonna try to go in there and wrestle, they're gonna go in there and work takedown defense. Okay, well we're gonna work takedowns. Yeah. And we're gonna see who's and takedown it, versus your takedown yeah. defense, who's better. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I'm already just, pretty good at it. I'm just gonna be a lot better than what you what you've seen. The the other thing with fighters, I feel like this is turned into you interviewing me. Yeah. Uh, yes. The other thing with fighters though is um a lot of fighters, and this is something that Allen really, re I always felt this way, but he he kind of reiterated to me, and I took it <coughs> more seriously. It's another reason why I don't have a lot of fighters. One thing I hate more than anything else on this planet is fighters who don't work during camp, outside of camp. Like they only fight, they only train when they got fights coming up. What's up, buddy? How you feeling? You feeling better? Oh, nope. still hurting? Yep. You all right, bud? Yep. You gonna make it? Ran up to my shoulder. I had to give myself a minute, man. I'm sorry. My little bitch assness got a hold of me, right? <laughs> a little bitch assness. Damn. Uh, what was I talking about? Belcher. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, something he does is he just trains all the time. Doesn't matter if he's got a fight coming up, he trains the same. He trains so many hours a day, every day, so many days a week, all the time, no matter what. He stays consistent. And so, he's always evolving. He's all, He just keeps getting better. All of his work just compounds, 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 compounds. How old is Belcher now? He's pushing 40, right around 40. 38 or uh, so? He's 39 or 40. He, I believe he's 39, about to turn 40. Um, that's impressive, dude. That's old for Yeah, it is. That's old for that. It, it really is. Um, so it just compounds. What a lot of fighters do is they get good enough to fight pro, and then outside of camp, because camps are so hard on them, outside of camp they quit training. They get fat. They eat like shit. They take a lot of time off. They might train Who's a couple the, days a week. Um, Patty. Patty Pimblett. Yeah, he yeah, does. That. He, 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 All he, fighters do it, though. He, he beats just, up. It, some people, it's just the food. Like, that was my that was my thing. But honestly, when I was fighting, I did the same thing. When I'd have a fight coming up, I'd get fat as shit. He takes it to a whole new level. He takes it to another level. Jesus I mean, there were times Christ. I would weigh in at 170. I'd walk back in the cage the next night at 190, and I'd be 210 by the end of the week. So I'd go from 170 to 210 within a Dang, week. Dang, dog. It was very common. I'd be 220, 230 within two or three weeks. It was within three weeks. I'd be. I would put on 40, 50 pounds. Um, just binge eating. Just eating every. I'd be eating whole boxes of little Debbie cakes, 
toaster strudels, uh, chips. I mean, I'd sit there. I'd drink two liters of, you know, peach soda in a sitting. I, you know, Mountain Dew. What? Just everything awful. How long did it take you to get down to 170, though? Uh, about six or eight weeks. So you went six or eight weeks without eating any of that right. shit. Right. So and then I would just that much. I would miss it so much when wow. I come back. I just binge and just that's eat crazy. all of it. I feel it like that's I what could. Patty does. You know. What you'd be better off doing is just keep your diet consistent. If you need a little bit of shit, eat a little bit of shit here and there. Just a little bit. Mm-hmm. Try not to eat any, but eat as little as you can. And when fight, the fight's over, be disciplined. And you can take a bite of that shit and spit it back out, right? I used to do that shit. It's nasty, but I used to do it. I'd Man. take a bite, chew it. But it's, it's not the same if you don't get to swallow it. Really? Really? It's not the same. Yeah. There's something about it just rolling in the back of your, the, your, your back. Your taste buds in your <laughs> mouth and just swallow. Oh, man, it was just amazing. I remember I was, fight, I was fighting in 170 one time. Hey, I wanted to ask y'all. I didn't ask y'all in the last episode. When y'all was uh, riding down and coming back, what'd y'all do? Like, did y'all listen to podcasts, music? Uh, what'd y'all you want to see? <laughs> y'all, was, y'all was making videos? Oh, yeah. Y'all yeah, want to see? I will put it on. Mo, I'm going to airdrop this to you. I thought you said we couldn't do that. Airdrop? No, no we couldn't. Back, we play couldn't that do. on here. Oh, we can play it on here. Y'all wasn't doing like Tristan, was you? Was y'all saying the forbidden fruit word? <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I don't think so. Soft R. Is Soft. your airdrop on, Mo? Oh wait, I'll just I'll send it in the group. Oh, I don't think I can send it in the group. It's too big. Yeah, it's too big. That's what she said. Maybe connected to Wi-Fi, I might be able to. Yeah, it's too long. I tell you, uh, I'm shorten it. Why you work on that? Is uh, someone I was very impressed with, Ben Hardy. He went on a uh, county line with Lee Carl, which I mean they grew up together, but uh, he he is an incredible guest to have on the show. Really, he's got a he's got a plethora of like just topics that he's good to go on. Does that make sense? Like he's good to talk about like whatever. So his dynamic is just talking about anything. Yeah. Hmm. And he, you know, Does he, he have a podcast. Does he? Hold on one second. No, he just don't post it, Emma. He just he just supports all of us. Okay. Yeah. So how how did you meet him? Uh, I met him through Daniel Sharp, and uh, he's a musician, like in Philadelphia. He's like famous in that area from his band uh, in his heyday, All Around Hounds, and at the Neshoba County Fairgrounds, when we would all meet up to. Play on the porch. Uh, ben Hardy would come play drums for us. Okay. When I think so, playing on the porch, I think somebody playing with your butthole without going inside of it. Thanks. I'm sorry. That's what I think about. You ever heard of that playing on the porch? Uh-uh. You know, if a girl's That's giving a you a first. BJ and reaches back and just kind of tickles your butthole, she ain't going inside, but she's playing on the porch. Um, uh, never. Okay, y'all continue. I, is that I'm like gonna keep, I'm gonna mm-hmm. keep doing this? So if she puts her finger in your ass, is that going? That's in the going house? inside. That's going in okay. the house. But if she plays on the porch, it's just a little like. Play on the porch. Snoo on me, baby. Okay, I'm sorry. Y'all keep, y'all keep talking. I like it, though. Yeah, I've, I I don't disagree. Do you want to play on the porch tonight? I don't want to play on anybody's porch. I mean, that's why you do porch talk, right? Damn, dog. We got a conundrum on my hand. I've got to change my show name now. Yep. Why do they call him Porch Daddy? It's because he's sucking you off and putting his fingers around your B.O. <laughs> hey, bro. I mean, you know, you're going to have a lot more fans now. Are they fans? The gays are going to be on your team now. Oh, they are, I've already got the gays. No, you got no, the gays? No, the, no, gays the family gays, not the gay people. You I can't got, call gay people the gays. I got all, I got all, all walks of life. Uh, man, we're just... Uh, we're you got gay. any trans? Trans? Yes. Uh, not the transmission? first, but the second. Class. I've, I've interviewed a trans. Transmission? Mm-hmm. Or transvestite? Transmission. Okay. From a Ford or a Chevrolet? Uh, it was actually from a Subaru. You, he said, "Don't post that one. That one's embarrassing." Well, no, it's just it, it doesn't really do a good job. Like you, you, it's just it's got too much of us talking and stuff. So I trimmed it and made it. You made it, a good clip of us dancing and carrying on. Yeah, aka. Yeah, I just wonder what the that, boat ride I just wonder what that car ride was like because I remember like how hyped I was like talking about it. And I was it like, was intense. It was I an intense car ride. Hey, I hate I couldn't sure. be there. Like that was right, probably, it should be now. That probably was the funnest car ride I've had. That's what I think, dude. I think a, I think a man up like all all four of us. I was trying to get y'all get right. I know, I know. I, I had to fucking work and everything. And to be else, fair, too. like it wasn't just it wasn't just ten minutes of fun. 
Yeah, it was, it was, it was two and, and a half, hour. three hours. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. You want to see what we did on the car? Is that the second video? I trimmed it up a little bit. There you go and post it. I don't. I don't know who's that in the back. Is that Maddie? No, that's Taylor, Taylor his wife. Uh, oh, Taylor went. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Road dog, road dog Taylor. She's y'all back there see, singing too. See what the what the car was. She get like. down with it. Yeah, she got to be. I'm sure she was. I hope we don't get in trouble for that. <laughs> <laughs> Man, we are too strong. She's back there getting Look at that finger out. I feel like she's back there holding it over the floor. <laughs> That's like a 10 minute long video. Man, I, and I'd have to go oh, ahead and drive and find it. I was it. driving with Cole today and he was cracking me the fuck up, dude. With who? Cole. Um, roommate. Oh. Uh, I call who? Brent. Oh, okay. No, Brent. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> he always cracks me up when I ride with him. Cause it's like I don't I don't fucking do, I don't have a whole lot of road rage, but I always think it's funny like riding with someone with road rage. Yeah. But and like in this particular situation, it's peculiarly funny because he's upset with everyone around him because he's not the one paying attention because he's on his phone trying to pick out the next song. <laughs> and when he looks up, he's like flipping somebody off and calling them dumbass. And I was like, you're the dumbass. You, it was you. Yeah. And like after like two times of that, sounds like in, a, in, a, yeah, in, a, like that. in a 30-minute ride, just on 82, and, like, after the third one, I was like, you know that guy you're flipping off right now currently? Yeah. F- fuck that guy. And I was like, <laughs> you're actually in the wrong. You know what I do? I got a friend that way. My buddy Joe, he's that way. <laughs> he's, he's got bad. sincere road rage. And I just, I'm on his team. Just yeah. hype him up. I'm on his team, bro. And like I'm, I'm like <laughs> unlocking the glove box and pulling the gun out, <laughs> just like, getting ready. Like Joe will get mad, and I'm like, yeah, bro. He'll be like, man, fuck you. I'm like, yeah, fuck. I just say, I'm like, yeah, fuck him. Yeah, me and you, Joe, we're on teams, bro. Me and you, teams, not him. Me and you me are and on you. teams, not him. And I'll, I'll just say it just like that, and I'll just make him laugh. And it, it's kind just, of bring him out of it. It's really the only way to bring him out of it. I just, I just make a joke out of it. I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah I, th- I think I'm going about it the wrong way, but it's like, too bad dude, you're can... actually, you're actually the asshole, dude. No, I should like just mock him like that. Yeah, just make it a big joke. Yeah, we're like, yeah, yeah. yeah you it. are pretty dumb. Fuck him for going 45 and a 40. He had to learn it the hard way, didn't you? I did. Yeah. Well, oh, because he got mad at me a couple times. No, because he almost killed a guy. Oh yeah, well, I started doing it before that. I just oh, wasn't really? there. Oh, you're talking about it at the law. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That was a little bit more than road rage, though. What was that, Joe Rage? Have I ever told that story on you? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I thought I had. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that was just that baby rage. That was that, that was that protein rage protein. coming out. Like, right. Protein. Rage. Speaking of like Fitzpatrick and you and Joe and you and Wes, that damn picture that Fitzpatrick shared. Oh, yeah. Boy, what a fucking squad that was. Yeah. Yeah, damn, old dude. school man. It was at my wedding. You look like the baby of the group. Yeah, well, I am. Are you? I'm the youngest out of everybody. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, you even looked at it in the picture. I'm, I'm the youngest out of everybody by quite a bit. I was probably 25 in that picture. Did I save it? Oh, I didn't. Oh, but I saved some. Here's a picture of me and me and Kevin as blue belts together. If y'all want to see, I don't know y'all can't really see it. But. You look like Meth Head Ken right there, dog. Meth Head Ken. Like, yeah, you know Ken from Barbie. Meth head can? Yeah, y'all skinny looking. Look at what Mo used to look like. Mo rip. He was like a little rip savage, man. Let me see that. Let me hold that. That was Mo? Yeah, it was Mo at his fight when he fought at a fight. Mo, where the fuck? Never mind. Good look. You look good, Mo. Yeah. Where'd his hair go? Damn, I wasn't going to say it. <laughs> Here's me and Wes after one of my fights at 185. At the, at, I, I, Wes looking fucking trim and slim right yeah. there, baby. Yeah, he. Uh, that was... He was he was training consistently at that time. He that looks was, he looks pretty good right there. Like he, he was looks, fighting right there. Yeah. He was fighting one seventy right there. He was like sixty yeah. pounds lighter right there. 
like saying. What do you think uh, he was whispering in that guy's ear? Uh, just he had a pretty mouth, I think. Mm. Yeah, I think so. I think he said, I like your tattoo. I had a fight one time. That was after a fight. I, you have shitty tattoos, but I have the shittiest one. <laughs> <laughs> I like that guy's four leaf clover. Yeah. Um, You're not so lucky now, are you, boy? <laughs> exactly. He was, because Wes lost that fight. At the time, he was. Yeah. But it really was almost like a lucky scramble because Wes was beating his ass the whole fight. And then he just like ended up on top, like on bottom, just lost the scramble, ended up on bottom, and nobody threw a few punches. They stopped the fight. Really? Yeah. They stopped it pretty quick. I'm not They'd gonna say it was stopping a bad the stopping. amateur fights, man. Yeah, the amateur fights they stop quicker. If you get on top of an amateur fight and you start raining down some blows, if you don't do something pretty quick, they're probably gonna stop it. You know, especially for Mount. Who got him? I mean, something, uh, something that we were talking about earlier to bring it back. Uh, and it, this, it may be just fear porn. I'm just listening to someone such as a Rand Paul in uh-huh. the Senate talking about there's this law. I like Rand Paul. I do too. I've, I like his dad better. Mm-hmm. But um, anyway, same. Big Ron Paul guy. True, li- true libertarian. Yeah. Like I still see Ron Paul stickers around Starbucks, and it makes me just giddy. It's like we yeah. see Ron Paul stickers. Yeah. yeah. It's like someone feels like I did. Yeah, I voted for him when he when he was running as Republican. I yeah, two thousand eight. Yeah, that mm-hmm. was the first first voting I did when John McCain beat him. Yeah. Yeah, and which is crazy. Horseshit. I'm not a big John but, uh, McCain but, guy. So. Yeah, I'm not a war hawk either. Yeah. Also, um, he was the one who got MMA taken off of pay per view back in the nineties. Fuck that guy. Yeah, he was the one Ooh, who John rest in really? rest in piss. Yeah, he he uh, he's the one who got the UFC banned from being televised for many many years. Many but years. Uh, the original UFC, Rand Paul was UFC. like uh, he was, and I don't know how much of it's fear porn or like fear mongering, but like supposedly I don't know if this goes back to the Patriot Act back in two thousand one with Bush. And it got escalated with Obama, and now, like, we are where we are now. But if Biden wanted to, supposedly, there's this act or law that was passed to where if he wanted to shut down, like, parts of the Internet, he could. Yeah. And, like, let's just say, like. Oh, that's coming. Like, that's coming, bro. And so, like, if, you, if, if you're not doing the kind of speech they like, well, you're just not allowed in this country. It's already kind of starting to happen. But it's happening by the, from the private sector. Right now, the private sector is going along well enough, I think, that they're not going to do it. But if the private sector just becomes wild west and they start letting people say whatever they want to, the government will 100% step in yeah. and start regulating speech. 100%. 100%. They just can't. I think what's happening right now, you have the private sector using money and influence to buy government influence, and then you have the government influence through in that same, like, who's actually in charge is this weird morphed beast between the private sector and the government where they both are influencing well, each other. You know, the way I look at it like this, and I think you're absolutely correct, is the private sector had a hand on it. You had uh, Google, which is Alphabet, which owns YouTube. Well, let's just say every election cycle, they they allow what you are to be able to view by the algorithm and what they put on your homepage and what you see. And then you have someone such as us who uh, should be back monetized YouTube because, like, I think we're doing... Technically, they didn't get rid of our monetization. They just demonetize every video. Yeah. Like, individually. So yeah. our account is monetized. We make, and like, so, $6. And then someone like us mo- begins Ball. to move to Rumble. Well, and that's where, like, now instead of Twitch, you have Kick, and you have these people who are willing to invest in building a new way of doing things when the other side breaks. But that's the kicker. is That's when uh, Big Daddy government gets involved and be like, if you can't get it together privately, I'm just going to punish everybody, yeah. you know? Yeah, it's a matter of time. It's a matter of time. We're headed toward a one more government, I think. That's gonna. That's gonna. Because that's the only way they're gonna be able to do it. Really, I don't know if they can succeed on that. They're gonna have to. But I, I, I think they're too stupid, Jake. No, I don't. I think. I think the moment that we find if there's aliens or not, the moment everybody even believes that there's aliens, one world government's gonna be a must. It's gonna happen. We need. We're gonna have to have a unified voice in the universe. Then we'll have that. Uh, I'm doing so my if, part from if there's Starship a, Commander or whatever. Yeah. Even if there's not a. Even if the aliens aren't real. I mean, if they want, all, that's all they have to do to, to get to a one world government is aliens. make us believe it. If, if, they, if we believe there's aliens. I think there are aliens, but... Um, yeah, they're called demons. I don't believe that, but okay. I mean, that's fine. Interdi- I wrong. believe in interdimensional things. Okay. Uh, I mean, like, if you go on a psychedelic trip, 
you you can step into those dimensions. I don't believe in like uh, motherfuckers living on Saturn. Are you telling me like there are multiple universes and like there there's possibilities of aliens from those universes? Well, as a Christian, that kind of demoralizes and wow. de- and diminishes how big my God is. No, I think it, I think you're diminishing how big God is. You don't believe that God can be the master of multiple universes? I don't think. I think. I think God loves this universe so much that's the only one. Why? That is so humanistic and and ideal. Like that. That puts that puts us on such a pedestal to God. Yes, you're it does. making God small to me there. Like you're 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 saying that God loves this universe so much he couldn't have that he sent his that, son, dog. That's like saying though that. God maybe he loves, sent his son to those universes too. Though. Maybe, maybe he didn't need to. Maybe every universe is another version of no, reality. We, we all which, need a devil, dude. There's all there, if there's if like full reality for existence to be here. That, I, you you have to have that worldview. The puts ki- God. In you such have a to box. have the culture. You have for, to evil goods. You have to have that, Jake. The, the difference between me and you is this: you believe that God's love for us means he can't love something else you believe that um you believe that god is so small that he only is capable of a single singular universe that he's limited by evil that evil is a must because god is good there must be a devil and that the same rules of the universe and other universes have to apply to this universe for god to be truly infinite he couldn't like for you to for you to in any way wrap your head around God for you to believe that you understand God and his love so much that he could only love this one group in this one place in this one universe puts him into a box so that you can understand him that's what I think I see what you say like like if you believe in it like you can't even understand infinity for you to pretend that you can oh, I get understand, lost in it, brother, looking for, in my mind for it. For for you to pretend that you can understand the author of it is so humanistic to me. Oh and hell that's, yeah! And that's my problem with Christians in general because Christians in general put God in such a box. I believe God is the author of infinity on in every aspect of the word. So when you talk about uh, an infinite being that's so infinite. Not only is he infinite, he's the author of infinity. Well, like to tell you this is like I, I don't, I do not disagree. Like, and I've I have been working on like my view of that, and to broaden out my scope for just how big I believe that God is, could be, and is, or however you want to put it. But like, here it is. It goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Is I want Tyler's viewpoint on this when you get done. Nope. It was uh, un- understanding is like when I'm coming up for gym class or the haircut scenario that you get. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, nope. how, how, do I, how do I approach a God in prayer? How, how do I feel like I know God if I can't? And you said, well, the Bible tells us who God is. It doesn't tell us. No, it, doesn't. It, doesn't, it doesn't tell us who all it, God it, is. God tells us, the Bible tells us, gives us an, enough information for our stupid, small, little, insignificant brains to somewhat be able to wrap our mind around him. If he is everything that we say he is, if you think that you can wrap up what he is in a book that's this thick, that's I mean, what ridiculous. Did, what did John say at the end of his gospel? If we were to write of all the stories, the tales, and the miracles of Jesus Christ, this would be the book of books, and it would span and wrap around the whole earth. Right. And so he's like, "What I'm t- what I'm giving you is it's like a, it's, it's all a, it's it, I, all I'm giving you is all you need." Yeah, it's I I don't know that I'd say it's all it, I, it's all we need, but like that's my problem with uh but i mean like man like when i approach god in prayer and like when i'm reading my bible in the morning when i'm doing my devotions and things it's like i'm approaching like this god as someone who could like sit down next to me in my study and can be with me and is also big enough to be in every part of this world you know in 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 space and time sure but i mean that's another thing about like he's omniscient He's omnipresent and he's like he's all he's all powerful. He's sovereign. He's, he exists outside of time. So yeah, it matter. yeah. He's all and like 
while we're at it, man, time is a construct anyway. It's like, what the hell? Like, what, what do you mean time's a construct? Well, I mean, every time we go to this fall back or springing forward and we're doing daylight savings or not, and like, I mean. Time like, and that, the number on your phone are not the same thing. Oh, hell no, it's not. Like, time, time is an arrow. Bring, like, so, so theoretically, time is a fabric. It's not a circle. Well, yeah, it's a fabric. It's a, it's, it, it, and it also, they, we believe, is affected by gravity. So we know that it's a fabric that just kind of exists in the same way that air exists or the same way that, that light exists. Or, and we are only capable in our bodies of experiencing time in a one-dimensional arrow in one direction manner. Yeah, but God is everything, everywhere, right. all at so once. So here's what you got to understand about time, and this is what this is what I believe. Okay, now I don't have any scripture to back this up. Okay, I believe that time is infinite. Not only infinite in a singular directional pattern, it's also infinite up in, and every, down. In, in, in every pattern. God exists in time with simultaneously with every decision that ever could have been made. I like that. Dog. Every difference. That it's like we're living in our multiverse. We, we live in the multiverse of time. We're only able to experience one dimensionally. God yeah. could God experiences time infinitely dimensionally. But there's that MLB baseball so, player, Jake, somewhere. Every small difference that could ever happen is just as real to God as this one is. Oh, hell yeah. So, so when you talk about God, it's the same thing with like uh, – uh, the argument of predetermination in, uh, like, d- does God already know what's going to happen, or has it already happened, or it- it's free will a thing? And then people try to say, well, free will is not a thing because everybody who's going to go to hell has already been predetermined who's going to go to hell and who's yeah, that's not. That's interesting. Uh, circles of uh, Baptists are running, dude. I ran in those Calvinists. The problem with Calvinists. that circle, with the Calvinists and the Baptists, is they are only experiencing God on a level of which where time is an arrow. You're, you're putting God in a box. Time's not an arrow to God. Everything is a reality to God. There's every possibility to God, in my opinion. Everything okay. that could have happened did happen, and he's experiencing it all simultaneously. Well, simultaneously. If, if we take a more Pentecostal approach, like in style of worship, whether it be through speaking in tongue or doing dancing, or let's say like uh, we wanted to drink some strychnine, battery acid, and handle serpents, like how far do we push this envelope? Well, I think again, I think that we do. I think, and I know, ask, I, and I know, I'm we, elevating it, right? And and I was raised Pentecostal, so when you look at, okay, do we have free will? Is everything predetermined? This is my answer to it. Yes, both, both are true. Both. How many heavens would you say there is then? Just one heaven. I don't. I don't. I don't. I think that our construct of heaven is is given to us in a manner in which we can understand. Well, here's my thoughts on everything you're saying and, and the way I'm taking it in. So is there going to be an infinite version of you in hell and in heaven as well? I think that I think that I live my brain and my understanding of infinity is too small for me to even comment. I think that question, I think though. that Do you understand? I think that possibly I think that there I, I think that there is a possibility of, of an infinite version of heaven and an infinite version of hell. So well, I think my, like that. That does good. my question make sense though? Like, yeah, it does make sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get what you're saying. Is there going to be a, an infinite number of me's in heaven versus an infinite number of me's in hell versus an infinite number of me's that whatever? And, but, and, and that does make sense. I think that there is a possibility of of that. I think that God experiences time, space, and matter all infinitely, simultaneous, simultaneously all at once. outside of it. Mm-hmm. God does not exist in time inside time, space, or matter. That's why I do believe in the Big Bang Theory. I believe the Big Bang Theory proves that there is a God because I believe that there was a time when there was no time, there was no space, and there was no matter. Then there was time, space, and matter, Mm -hmm. which means that there was action taken to create those three pillars of the world that we live in, time, space, and matter. You can't have matter without time and space. You can't have space without time. Time is the fabric which everything is laid out on because without time you make space but where do you put it without yeah. matter without you can't have matter without space because you, without matter without space there's nowhere to put it, put it. Mm-hmm. right yep. so in a moment you had the creation of time you had the creation of space and you had the creation of matter and i believe that what i believe god is is the being that exists outside of time space and matter is not limited by time space and matter but i also like uh 
when it comes to like free will or predetermination or predestination, however you want to put it, yeah, is predestination. Like, that's right. What is Predestination. It absolutely is. Is like I do not see God as like someone. Let's say as looking at the world as if it is some kind of a board game, and he is like arranging the pieces and moving everything. If if that were the case, well, I would believe like there is no free will and that there is there's only one way that you're John we know that that's not true yeah because John said I believe it was in John said that it's God's will for everyone to go to heaven yeah if it's God's will for everyone to go to heaven but not everybody goes to heaven that means that we operate outside and and we know it's God's will for everyone to go to heaven because God made the way for everybody yeah and but and then also said in the Bible that it's his will for yeah. everyone to go to heaven. Yeah. It's his will for no one to ever go to hell. And so like I don't I don't see God as like someone like over the monopoly table and like calling all the shots. I think like like we're all like you said, he's he's outside space time and matter and like, you know, hey, well, it's a miracle I wasn't aborted, you know, or whatever else. So it, it's a miracle I survived seven car crashes it's you know and like i'm still fucking here and we're on this trajectory so like where do we go from here what do you think about it tyler i don't you don't think about it Mm-mm. you really just don't have these thoughts at all Mm-mm. you never wonder about time it's like the first no, because there's no here. like there's no answer i'll never get an answer until i'm dead yeah but is there not is there not value uh, in wondering no value in thinking about not it not certain things no i mean if, especially if especially if you're pondering and meditating on god or Time and the w- reasons we're here, and that's one thing. Like, I'm I spend here. a lot. That's the unfair advantage I get to not being able to do drugs. Like, there's a lot of things I don't care about or think about. I, I, did, I thought about this stuff way before I ever did drugs. Just saying, like, you yeah, I don't think thought, it's a drug related thing, dude. Ponder on it a lot more when you're in a For sure. meditative state versus me, which I'm never really. And I also like think this is like, I mean, you're living in Mississippi now, and like I'm from Alabama. I grew up in Alabama, but I. Twin state, I do agree with that notion, but like one thing that I'll say about growing up here was we might not have had the nicest things and we might not have had the the fastest internet. We may have not had, um, you know, all the the best sport teams or in college, yeah, and that's why we care so much about it. But like we had to make our own fun, and like I believe our imaginations and our creativity is a lot higher. I think that's why Mississippi. Uh, creates more stars musically or even in the movies than any other state per capita. Yeah, it does. Because, like, we create, we have to create our own fun because, like, there's nothing else here for you to do. You have, you have to. Yeah. yeah. Or you can be a complete piece of shit. Yeah, and it's, a lot it's, of you do. It's hard to be a complete piece of shit when there's nothing to do, though. Yeah. Like, it's easy to be a complete piece of shit when you've got a video game system and you got cable or TV and you've got. Hot pockets, and you know, but if you hard to be a piece of shit when it's like okay, you can sit in this hot house. With I no finally AC figured out what do, or I finally play. figured out what incel stands for. You know, when people call someone an incel, all right, involuntarily celibate. Huh, okay, that's what incel means. Involuntary that is celibate. like the worst cut down you could cause. You it's, are it's a, pretty rough, you're huh? an incel, like you want to have sex, but you can't. Yeah, yeah, you, you would yeah. be, but you're not capable. Yeah, that sucks. Where did I do that at? A lot of people. I was. I heard a statistic earlier on a podcast that absolutely cannot be true. What? He was saying that twenty six to thirty one percent of men between the ages of eighteen to thirty have zero sexual partners. I do what? That probably twenty six and thirty one percent of that probably ain't far off, uh, dude. Men between between twenty six and thirty years old. On average, 26, and 26 to 31 percent of 18 to 30 year olds. Oh, I'm sorry, that probably ain't far off. Have zero sexual partners. That's in so virgin till you're 30. Yeah, or maybe you had sex before 18. Well, I mean, just, they didn't study before 18. Well, think about this. I was, and we've talked about it in the past, but of uh, man, how quick is porn introduced to young men now? Like, I, yeah. you're probably eight, nine years old the first time you're. That's crazy. You're you're exposed to porn, and like we know what that does to the to the brain, and so it wouldn't be uncommon for me. We for like, know what it does to the brain. Oh, we've we've got a pretty. Good, it makes fucking psychopaths. I don't think it makes psychopaths. Now. I think it like a lot of those well, true crime motherfuckers. Think about your Jeffrey Dahmer's and uh, 
And, and a lot Your of the porn's not making a psychopath now. Fucking, it's bad for the mm, brain. But a psychopath is someone incapable of feeling empathy. Watching pornography does not make you incapable of feeling empathy. I, I it makes it harder and harder for you to get off. You can't have a sexual connection. I don't know if I agree with that either. I don't know if I agree with that. I think that it. I think that it definitely okay. makes you push the boundary of what I don't, type of sexual depravity. I don't think you need we should have it. Off. Like going back to the OnlyFans thing, going back to the porno. I do not think that porn is is fucking necessary. I'm not saying it's necessary. The argument that I'm having with you right now is: Does it create psycho psy, psychopathy? Does it create psychopathic behavior? To my knowledge, Why, there is wh- zero correlation. Between okay, psychopathic with, behavior. with a lot of these school shooters, I think we could go back on the internet history and probably say that they watched a lot of fucking porn. I could, we could also because, go to a lot of people that fail tests and see a lot of porn. You can listen, go back on but a listen, lot of Jake, single men and married men and see a lot of porn. Jake, but yeah, for the most part, dude. <laughs> Everybody's watching porn. I don't know how to argue this one. I've watched a shit ton of porn and I've got like a shit ton of times and I've not killed anybody. Right, that's what I'm saying. Bro. I don't like, know. Like, there, there's no, yeah, like, okay. You're saying you think that you could go back on these guys' uh, search history and see porn. I'm not saying that you could. Maybe they're not watching the kind of porn you are, is what I'm okay, saying. So Maybe they've leveled up. Right, but what, what level of what level of pornography are we talking about? How murder much porn, porn do you maybe? have to watch so you're watching murder porn? Or is it just that people who are psychopaths, because psychopath is a brain disorder. We know happens at birth. It happens If you're a psychopath, you're just a psychopath. There's nothing you can do to not be a psychopath. You just are a psychopath. That doesn't mean you're going to kill people. doesn't mean you're going to do fucked up shit. It just means you are a mm-hmm. psychopath. And to say that you think that pornography is what's creating that psychopathy. I think, I think it's part of it. I mean, do you have it so based birth on defect? what, though? It's a birth defect. Right, it's just, it's a, it's, it, psychopathy I is have a, been doing true crime studies now for two years. You watch this shit on true crime TV? No, fuck no. <laughs> I look, I look into the lives of these people okay. and, and read their biographies. Right, but, but, okay, that's, you could, let me argue the point you're about to make before you even make it. All right, do you think that fried chicken might be creating psychopaths? Because I guarantee you, you could look in the lives of every single psychopath, and I bet you they ate a lot of fried chicken. Well, that's a little bit ribs, fucking, maybe. It's a little fucking different. How? Number one, you got the triangle of uh, the making of. You piss the bed. You're making the cats and dogs uh-huh. by killing them. Mm-hmm. And number three, uh, fire arson. Right. Porn's so all porn. It adds to it. I think that's uh, that's uh, that's a, right. That's what the, sets it all. The bed. And here's the thing too about peeing the bed. Both of my kids peed the bed, and I peed the bed. Right, both of my sons pee the bed. We all pee the bed, but I if you're peeing pee the, the bed, bed when you're fucking 15, that's a problem. But you think that pornography's creating that? I don't know what the fuck is causing you to pee your bed at 15. Maybe you're drinking too much goddamn water. That's I don't, I don't right, know. But that, that's the point. Like, <laughs> I, 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 I don't I'm understand gonna, I'm gonna cha- I'm going to challenge you if you're not creating, bringing a correlation. Like, I don't know why we're defending porn. I'm not defending porn. You're just saying something that I view as ridiculous, so I'm going to call you out on it. <laughs> that's, I view what you're saying is not true. So while I don't think I'm, porn I'm is good saying, for the brain, I'm saying like most of these fucking like, Okay, well the uh, well the Unabomber would probably be an exception because he was celibate. Okay, uh, but like with a lot of these uh, true crime freaks, these serial killers, they were typ- into with some weird shit. And don't you think that maybe the lack of empathy that they had naturally just made it so that that led to they, the, they, them being into they, the weird they, shit? They more did. Than- they did not grow up. I would I would say like their family life, like the the family structure they grew up under, maybe. Uh, uh, minimal dad or no dad uh, for a psychopath or a sociopath? Mom, sociopath. Okay. Mom. Now mom, we're talking about a totally different thing. There's, there's this mom, psychopath and sociopath. Mom, mom is, uh, you know, like the way that they see men because, like, mom is just trying to get laid, and they see a whole lot of men. Maybe those men are taking advantage of the child. Thought like you've had too much to drink for this conversation. There, no, there, there it's is a hard left. Yeah. There's usually like some sexual abuse there. Okay. But we're talking about the difference between, we're talking about psychopaths. Now we're switching and we're going to sociopaths, which is a totally yeah, different we should, thing. Well, let's let's fucking back it off and let's talk about it another time then. Okay. I, I don't know. Okay. 
I mean, like, we're, <laughs> Don't we're get out. mad, man. I just I am not mad. Okay, I am just Don't telling you with me. I just that I that I agree. Don't okay. start acting like a psychopath. I think I think I, I don't think porn is good because I think it gives you an unrealistic expectation of sexual partners. I think that it's it, I think it gives you an instant gratification of sexuality that that instead of going out and actually like meeting women and and getting like learning game and like uh, uh, becoming the kind of person that women want to fuck. Instead, you sit at home and beat your meat reading hot pockets and and playing Call of Duty. Damn, you know, dog. what if I, you just got to rub one out before you leave the house? I think sometimes that that's okay. At the same time, though, I think you watch start watching too much porn. I did that before I came here. I think it, it might. Yeah, I mean, I think it might. Crew, <laughs> are you going to be a psychopath? Now? Yeah. You didn't watch porn. Oh, you did. Okay, of course he did. Well, I mean, you th- but you were just saying you thought it could turn you into psychopaths. I was joking. I would never do any of that. You're joking about rubbing one out, or yeah. thinking that it turn? Okay. <laughs> yes. It's r- okay if you did, man. I didn't. I did because I'm not. I haven't done it today, <laughs> but I did it twice. It's a good positive, but I also had sex today. So two times, two times, two times. That technically counds. Okay. Yeah, what? but this was my wife. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's uh, mine yeah. too. What did you do with God's children? <laughs> <laughs> Right, <laughs> throw them up in there, baby. You know, hell yeah, dude. Let them leak out. <laughs> just, Let them go where they may. <laughs> just, you go where you want to go. Well, my wife's got her tube side, bro. Like I, I can, I can do whatever Ooh, I want. Matter of fact, God's I left God's ch- God's children never escaped my body. What do you mean? Got a vasectomy. Oh, like the actual children don't then? Yeah. yeah. Just got baby gravy, dog. There's no <laughs> children. Well, it's just gravy. It's just yeah. gravy. There's yeah. No baby gravy. It's just gravy. Yeah. I am the temple of God's children. Dude, right this now. episode sucks. Let's get the fuck out of here. Uh, I think this is a great episode. <laughs> I, I don't know. Oh, now you sorry. like yeah. a good episode. Yeah, I, I wish I hadn't got injured mid episode. Uh, yeah, probably would have been. But a you know, sh- shadow boxing is a serious thing. Yeah, you hit something hard, didn't you? Didn't hit something hard. That's right. right. You hit nothing hard. Hit nothing hard. But I am. I am injured, and it went up to my shoulder, and I thought I was having a heart attack. Got it, man. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. You need a hug? Maybe. I don't know. Well, guys, I'm sorry uh, about this episode. It was uh, bad. <laughs> it was great. It was bad? No, it was good. It was good. I, I, I enjoyed what I was watching over there. It, the, it definitely the had a lot sideline. of depth. It changed. We definitely went a lot. I interviewed you tonight. Yeah, you did. And then it, we, then we had a little bit I of I like doing that to you every now and then. Yeah, I don't mind it. I don't mind it. I didn't push you. back on you. Like, we're... We're, we're going to do some more pushback. Yeah, give me a little pushback. You can give it to me now if you want to. You shock topped him a little too hard. Today, shock you? topped you a little too hard. Yeah, baby. I don't mind a little pushback. I don't mind a little pushback. And the thing is, if I if I have an opinion that I can't defend, I want you to push back on me because I need to know that. And I absolutely have opinions I can't defend. We'll, we'll bring some of these subjects up again. But like you said, I, I think like I would like to come a little bit more sober. Yeah, just rewatch, yeah, rewatch this whole episode and both notes. of you guys can just do <clears throat> I'm not gonna make notes. I'll just come more sober next time. I'll watch it. I I, I think that I think that you know, maybe having this conversation a little earlier in the episode (coughs) before you've had that much alcohol. Yeah, I can tell you weren't on your p's and q's. weren't ready, really ready to have the conversation. Well, I figured it would be light, and we kind of went heavy. Yeah, right. Yeah, Yeah. I figured it would be something that we would get into and get off. Right, but we kind of we kind of lingered. Kind of lingered. I mean, you just don't (laughs) just don't come in here attacking my favorite thing. Okay. <laughs> favorite thing is porn. That's probably not good. Yeah. Okay. But it's you, though. It's love, got nothing to do with me. Love it, man. Thank you guys so much for being on this episode. We're sorry. Uh, we'll we'll, uh, we'll, well see I'll you Well, I'll tell you somebody, though, it ain't Tristan. And I, you didn't get your Wednesday episode two weeks in a row, so eat my ass, buddy. <laughs> yeah. You're going to have it now. That's yeah. right. That's right. Anyway, guys, thank y'all so much for being on this episode. We'll see y'all on the next one. Make sure to go check out our socials. Check out the Man Up Podcast on YouTube, uh, uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, follow the Mississippi Superman. The Man Up Podcast is on that 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 you know channel on YouTube, but also check check me out on Instagram, Facebook, uh, and uh, TikTok. We'll see y'all next episode. What about the Mississippi Mean? <laughs>